PhD defense talk. Um, Gopi joined uh, UNM after doing a uh, master's with Anil Saji, who some of you may know was also had a UNM connection, uh, working on the problems of EQC1, everyone's favorite. Uh, but Gopi and I have been working together uh, since around 2015, 2016, and um, he's done a whole variety of things. We can tell you about what he's focused on here. But beyond uh, what we'll hear about in his defense, I just wanted to also say Gopi is one of the amazing citizens of Secret. Everyone knows how Gopi is always there to help all the other students when they come and arrive. And also, in, in many ways, he's been an excellent citizenship for the center. And I just want to let you know that's noticed and very much appreciated. And, uh, but now we're going to grill him on his defense. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Evan, and, and thanks to all the committee here who uh, is here and being on my committee. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gopi Krishnan Maradeshan. That is probably the first time you might have heard my full name. Uh, so I am going to talk about the work I have been doing during my PhD. All of this work was done under the supervision of Heisenberg. So the work is about the complexity of boson samples using atoms in optical electrons. So let me get into the motivation first and give you some kind of history of, of field and, and quantum computation. So in the early 1930s, when the topical computation was beginning to get its uh, you know, top form, uh, there were many prominent scientists, including Alan Turing and Alan Sutcher. Here is the same Turing who, after whom the movie uh, Invitation Game was made. So, throughout many works of these two great scientists, a thesis was developed, which is now commonly known as the standard church Turing thesis, which basically says that any computational problem that any device in nature, any physical mode of computation can solve can also be solved by a classical computer, more technically a tuned machine. So there have been many uh, you know, ideas whether this thesis is correct or not. And over the course of uh, several years after that, several physical devices or physical systems were discovered uh, which behave under the quantum mechanical laws. And it was in 1982 when uh, Richard Feynman came and is quantum, or is it, it is in classical. So if you try to simulate whatever happens in nature using classical computers, you are bound to have some issues, mainly because of the growth in the Hilbert, Hilbert space dimension that you know, and, and we know of the famous paper by Hammond and Carl here about um, what it is. Uh, and uh, after several two years, we have Peter Shore who he says discovered and not invented uh, the Shows algorithm, uh, which is regarding the fine prime factorization of images, uh, which beat the current known classical algorithm for the prime factorization, which is being used for you know, RSA algorithm and other interesting things. He also came up with the concept of quantum error correction, uh, which says that even in the presence of noise, we should be able to correct the errors and have a uniform, a universal quantum. Now, more recently, you know, in this era, which we call the noisy intermediate scale quantum era, or the NIST era, where we do not have a universal quantum computer yet, because of the technological challenges we have and the noise. Uh, so in this NIST era, what we are looking or going after is a small scale devices in the presence of noise. If it can perform a specific task, more efficiently than the current state of the art supercomputers, we say that that device performs something called quantum computational supernacy. And, and these two uh, terms was coined by Preskill and his famous talk, and afterwards it was uh, a publishing for So, just to repeat that, what we are looking for in this NIST era is whether a small scale device 
can do some specific task. It need not be a universal computer. It can do some specific task more efficiently than current state of the art supercomputers. Right? So there are many proposals to use these kind of soft, small scale devices to demonstrate this here. Uh, some of the early known motivation to use this is for explaining different quantum properties of many body physics, like quantum simulation of many body physics. And more recently, uh, there is this thing called the sampling complexity or sampling problems that were introduced for this purpose. So we very recently we heard uh, a claim from Google that they demonstrated uh, QCS with the device. And then there is a boson sampling problem which will be the focus of my thesis, which was introduced by as an article and there is a So regarding this uh, boson sampling which I have discussed over a few slides, uh, the motivation of my thesis was to see whether we can do this boson sampling using atoms in optical axis. So there are several motivations behind it. One, uh, it is potentially more scalable than the original platform in which it was introduced, the photons in linear optics. And it is going to be more feasible experimentally than the linear optics. Also, this is a flexible platform to study these two things combined. Like study on one side, studying the quantum properties of many body physics, and on the other side, we want to do this post sampling problem. So before getting into this most important problem, let me just give you some basics or some ideas that will be good to have to follow this problem. So this is regarding the computational complexity theory. So computational complexity theory is a theory of classifying problems according to their difficulty of solving. Now you might ask, what do you mean by difficulty of solving something? Right? So whenever we talk about the difficulty of solving something, we always denote that by the growth of resource that is required to solve it. It can be the amount of time taken by the computer to solve it or the amount of memory that it takes. So for most of these definitions, we always quantify this growth as a function of input size. So we'll have some input, let's say as, as n, it can be the length of the bit string or anything that uh, is the size of the input. So it can be a function of n, and we see whether it's a polynomial function, exponential function, or things like that. So a complexity class is defined as a set of problems with the same difficulty in this function. So, so we can uh, define complexity classes uh, with respect to several definitions. So some of them can be with the type of computational problem. So it can be a decision problem where you ask the question yes or no, or you are asked to quantify or calculate some quantity. And it can be counting problems where you are asked to count the number of solutions to some problem, or the so called sampling problem, which I will define uh, in a few slides. Or we can uh, differentiate these the complexity classes according to the model of computation. What, what device or physical model do you use for the computation? It can be classical computation or quantum computation. You can use physical device that behave under quantum mechanical laws to do the quantum or you can also differentiate these complexity classes under the resource that it takes. It can be the amount of time taken or amount of memory that you use to solve the problem. Some of the um, basic examples is first one is a complexity class C, which are a set of problems that a classical computer can solve in polynomial time. When I say polynomial time, it's polynomial in the input size. And we have complexity class NP where you can verify whether something is a solution or not. So given the problem, it might be hard to solve the problem, but we can verify whether uh, it's a solution or not. And we have also have the class PQP, which is naively the quantum analog of the class P, uh, just to say that it's a set of problems that a quantum computer can solve in quantum time. But to be more precise, it has to be under some boundary error condition. Right. So, what is the sampling problem? Right. So we, I, I talked to you about decision problem and counting problems. Now this is yet another class of problem. So in these sampling problems, unlike decision problems, we are not solving anything. We are not asked to calculate any quantity. So the task here, in simple words, is to generate random numbers according to some probability distribution. So you have to generate some samples with a given probability distribution. So for example, we all know about a binomial distribution. 
a simple series point process where you count the number of x dot a's uh, is a sample from this binary distribution. Or a garden board, tell me point, can also do this in polynomial time with respect to system size. So, but it so happens that there are several complex probability distributions uh, with which if a classical computer tries to, tries to sample from, it will take exponential amount of time. Or it is very difficult for a classical computer to sample from certain probability distributions. So this is where the sampling complexity arises. What is the complexity of a classical computer to sample from certain probability species? So just to define, you know, just to tell you about the scarlet board, you might have seen this in many gambling stations at Las Vegas or somewhere. Where you know the basic setup is that you just put in some classical uh, balls here, and at every point it can either go to left or right. And finally, it ends up in one of these boxes. And we know we can calculate the probability distribution of that, and we get the binomial distribution. And in, in large case limit, we can you know, approximate this by version. So, given this garden board, and if you use quantum particles instead of these classical boards, especially bosonic particles, which have weird counting statistics and they interfere with each other, given the quantum mechanical laws. The probability distribution is entirely different now. And it so happens that a classical computer finds it very difficult to sample from this distribution. So now let me explain uh, you know, some things about what you know what do these bosonic particles behave under. So so it is the uh, so I will tell you about what linear optics is. So linear optics is a set of all transformation of these uh, bosonic particles. Well, the output creation operator can be written as a linear combination of the input creation operator. So, what this in simple words tell you is that a photon coming in a mode can interfere uh, in this linear optical network and then come out of each of these output modes with some probability amplitude. That's what this, this equation is. So, this transformation, because of the fact that this is linear, no photons are created or destroyed. The total number of photons is conserved. And the simplest of such linear optical networks are phase shifters and beam shifters. So beam shifter in, you know, is something that when a photon comes into that, part of it transmits and part of it gets reflected. So the output state is a superposition of transmitted photon and a reflected photon with some amplitude. So linear optics at last scale is both of so over here, I show a figure, a simple figure describing what a boson sample is. So here I have a linear optical network consisting of several beam shifters and phase shifters. We have n input modes and n output modes. So the photons come in through this input mode because of these beam shifters, like the one I just mentioned. They interfere with each other. They something similar to the garden board I showed you. You can go left to right. But because they are quantum particles, they interfere with each other and finally come out of this output mode. So the total number of photons is conserved. So n photons go in and n photons come out. So they can come in, you know, the output state is now a superposition of all such states for the total number of photons is there. So it can, this is only one possible output that you can have. And at the end, you count the number of photons in each uh, output mode and that is the sampling process. So when you measure something, uh, what you get as the output is one of the samples, one of the output, output states with some property. So it was Anderson and Archibald who showed that the probability of a number configuration or to see a number of configuration in the output state is given by the permanent of this transition matrix. So lambda is a transition matrix or the capping matrix here. So a permanent is nothing but the determinant of a matrix if you replace all the alternating minus signs with plus signs. Right. So let me just explain that with a very simple case. So suppose we have a 2 by 2 system. We have two input photons and two photons come out. Right. And I am interested in calculating the probability of the output state where one photon comes out of each of these output photons. And here I have the lambda matrix or the transition matrix which gives you the probability amplitude of uh, each of these events. So lambda 1, 1, this gives you the probability amplitude 
of starting in first input say and ending in what first output. Okay, so this can happen in two ways. One, they can just pass through as if nothing happened, and the probability amplitude of this is given by lambda one one and lambda two two. So you multiply them. Now the other case is they can just switch the position, and the probability amplitude of that is given by lambda one two times lambda two one, and so if you see these two cases, they are indistinguishable because bosonic particles are indistinguishable. So quantum mechanics tells you that to find the total probability, you have to add the amplitude first and then take mod square. So you do that, and then you see this familiar function where it would have been a determinant if this is minus sign, but this is a plus sign and this is called the permanent. So one thing to get from these two slides is that the probability of finding a number configuration at the end. Is related to the permanent of the transition matrix. And That's a quick question. Sorry. Uh, so, in practice, though, the particles, I might not have exactly identical photons. Maybe you know, we have some good experimentalists, but maybe they're not perfect. And the two photons that come in, maybe come in at slightly different times. What would, what would, how would you deal with that? So. Uh, so I would say that uh, we could, uh, I should say that yeah, uh, me and my senior with Ivan actually studied this problem uh, in initial days, um, and so basically what happens is when this when the photons come in at different times, they are no longer indistinguishable. They become distinguishable particles, and for these distinguishable particles, we can write the output distribution as permanent of positive matrix. That's the main uh, point about that. So, it so happens that the uh, calculating the permanent of OCT matrices or approximating it is an easy task. And therefore, when it becomes indistinguishable, uh, one of the ways of which is what you do, it can be because of time delays, uh, the whole sample problem becomes easy. And there will be a transition from R to easy when we work with the time delay. Um, Right, so uh, I, I mentioned, I, I haven't mentioned it uh, directly before, uh, I would like to mention that the whole hardness of this sampling problem comes from the fact that calculating the permanent of matrices is a very hard thing to do for a classical computer. Unlike the determinant, which is an easy thing to do, because of the fact that determinant is invariant under similarity transformation. So you can just diagonalize the matrix and then calculate the determinant thereby. But permanent depends on the basis in which you write down the matrix. Or in this case, it depends on the basis in which you measure. So in my opinion, the hardness of sampling comes in because of the clever choice of the basis in which you are measuring. Okay. So this hardness of calculating the permanent and the hardness of sampling was this connection was made by Anson and Rafi for their paper. So what the theorem says is that the boson sampling problem, the problem that I just defined, is not efficiently solvable by classical computer. So no classical algorithm can sample or generate samples from the same distribution efficiently. So when we say efficiently, I always mean the time taken has to be a polynomial in the input size. That's what we mean by efficiency. So going on, I mentioned in my motivation that what my thesis is all about is trying to implement this boson sampling using atoms in optical analysis. So the original platform in which it was introduced was photons in linear optics, but we are trying to do this with atoms in optical analysis. So basically you can think of this uh, you know, lattice as the atoms are trapped in this lattice and then they can tunnel from one point to other which is very similar to how photons tunnel from from one input mode to another output mode. So some of the motivation for why we are considering this atoms in optical lattice and not sticking to the photons in linear optics is that there are many experimental limitations on uh, implementing boson sampling using photons in linear optics. So like the initial state preparation, as Ivan mentioned, uh, we have to be very careful uh, for the photons to be indistinguishable. So they have to be identical and they have to come in at the same time, etc. 
and we are looking at a single uh, box state of the photon. So all these things are very difficult uh, experimentally and also the photon counting uh, measurement. Uh, we have uh, brilliant experiments here who are working on this kind of problems of measurement, uh, but uh, photon counting is in general a very difficult. And this platform of neutral atoms, uh, and yes, I am advertising it, neutral atom quantum computation here, but using neutral atoms is more potentially scalable and also more feasible to do this. Um, and also, another motivation, as I mentioned before, is that it enables us to have natural connections to answer other kinds of problems, like uh, other quantum properties of many body physics, quantum simulation, etc. Yes? What do you say? Sorry, I know you are a photon guy, but... <laughs> <laughs> When you say uh, talking about photon counting as detectors, are you going to be talking about PNR measuring many box states, or is it always going to be zero or one? So, um, you know, we can, uh, you know, we can do with uh, single versus zero when we have this kind of condition where the number of modes is very large compared to the number of photons. <coughs> when, when the probability of a photon seeing each other is very limited and there's a high probability of single photons coming out of any of the output modes. But in, in general, I would suppose that you would need number of solving detectors other than single So some of the general questions that we try to answer in my uh, thesis here is first, what level of complexity can one achieve just by using a 1D lattice? When I say 1D, we mean that the atoms can only tunnel to the nearest neighbor. So we only have nearest neighbor tunneling parameters in the Hamiltonian. This is more commonly known as the tight binding model. Uh, and if you restrict to this 1D lattice, how do we implement the boson sampling? And also a natural extension of that would be what happens when you have interaction between the atoms. You know that uh, in contrast to photons, atoms can collide with each other and that uh, comes as a on-site interaction term. So what are the effects of that? And then, as I mentioned earlier, what are the connections of sampling complexity to other properties in uh, these atoms of lattices, like phase transition or any other property? Right. So let me just give you an outline of my thesis, and, and then we can uh, start with my work. So uh, the first project that we did, and for the committee, this is the uh, chapter four of my thesis. This is regarding uh, the complexity of sampling of non-interacting bosonic atoms in optical lattice. So where we ask the questions like, what is the complexity of sampling in 1D lattice, uh, etc. And then a natural extension of that is to see what is the effect of interaction in that. This is going to be my uh, chapter five in my thesis. And then my third project is regarding efficient generation of how random unity transfer. So in boson sampling, uh, one potential route uh, that Anson and Arctic Power proposed to do this in presence of noise, where the approximate boson sampling is also hard, the potential route was to use a random unity transformation in photosynthetic energy. So it's a natural question that how can we efficiently generate a random unity transformation in the systems that we discussed? So we actually do this using random Hamiltonian evolution that have time independence. But uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'll be concentrating on these two uh, projects, these two chapters. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions you have regarding uh, the other project. So I'll take a course here. This is a very good tradition among Sigway to <laughs> both advice by Carl to have a moment to pause and take a breath. And you know, if you have any questions uh, regarding the part that I described till now, uh, I'm happy to answer. Yes. So I was wondering, <coughs> this is a naive question. If you just take a galvan board and put an indistinguishable particle, you can just get boson sampling? Um, as long as they are classical, I wouldn't think so. Okay. So as long as they are classical, I think that the output distribution would always be you know, something like a positive. It's similar to a common of positive matrices. And we can use things like Monte Carlo simulation or something to always come up with sample measure. That's it. 
Right. Uh, moving on. So, my first project is regarding complexity of sampling in uh, of bosonic atoms, which are non-interacting in one d And this work uh, was done in collaboration with uh, Akimasa Miyake. And of course, another person of uh, Okay, so this is what we are concerned. So we have this Hamiltonian, uh, which describes the atoms in optical axis. So they are trapped in these data sites. And then this Hamiltonian describes how they can tunnel from one side to the other side. So the JLL prime describes the poverty amplitude of the atom starting in site L and ending in L prime. Right. And here, this angular brackets describes that I am restricting myself to nearest neighbor. So only L and L plus 1 or L minus 1 are connected in this way. Right. So this is the 1D that is. But now we ask the question, what level of complexity can be achieved with this Hamilton? To answer that question, we go to even simpler system by making this uniform and near neighbor. So this, we all know if we have a periodic system, this is a translationally invariant system and probably very easy to solve and find what are the energy at the spectrum of this. So we want to ask the question, in any regime, is this problem hard? Sampling from this apparently very simple system, can it be hard or not? So given this Hamiltonian, I can write down what the unitary evolution is. And since this is also a linear system, just like photons in linear optics, uh, the evolution of a PhD operator can be written like this. And this lambda is very similar to or same as the transition matrix that we uh, saw earlier, just that now it's a time dependent function. So because of the fact that we have this restriction, that we have a translationally invariant system and a very simple system, that reflects in the very specific structure of these transition matrices. So these matrices are what are called circulant matrices, uh, which basically have the property that a matrix element lambda ij only depends on i minus j. It does not depend on i and j. Uh, said differently, in the system, the probability of atom starting in a you know any lattice like i and ending in J does not depend on where it starts in, it only depends on the distance travel. Right? You're taking periodic boundary. Yes. <coughs> so, yeah, the, the subset I'm going to show are all for yes. periodic boundary. Okay. So, so, yeah, so now, uh, so what I'm plotting here is more lambda squared, that is the probability of an atom starting in I and ending in J with respect to I minus J. So I will told you that it's only a function of I minus J. So I'm plotting it against I minus J. So you can uh, you can notice that there's a band of elements here that actually <coughs> contribute the final probability distribution and an exponential if we gain band. And of course the band gets higher at the end because of the periodic quantum condition. So this is you know more familiar for people working in quantum random walk and this is just the ballistic evolution uh, in the free quantum walk, random walk. So in contrast to <laughs> classical random walk where the you know, bandwidth or if you have a Gaussian and which increases as square root of t, e, uh, here we have a linear growth in the band because of the quantum random walk. So this band is actually the first few diagonal elements of the uh, so now the question is, so I, sorry, I, I mentioned earlier that the complexity of sampling is very much related to the complexity of calculating the permanent or approximating the permanent. So the question now is, what is the complexity of approximating the permanent for these kinds of subclass of matrices, these very restricted class of matrices? So for this, what we found was, we found uh, there is an algorithm uh, that can approximate the permanent in this case, this, this is not here, the scaling of approximating the permanent with respect to n, which is the number of particles, and t, the total time of evolution. So the, uh, the complexity of approximating the permanent for a classical algorithm scales as n to the 4t, 
notice that it is exponential in the time of rotation. So this shows evidence that the sampling problem, the corresponding sampling problem, is easy as long as t scales as log in n. So here, if we have a log of n or log of any polynomial, we exponentiate that and we get a polynomial function. So it is easy as long as the time of rotation is log to in n. But what happens if time is faster than that? Something like a body log, or maybe in the worst case, if it is linear, we get a super polynomial or exponential behavior in the complexity of approximation of that. So in this case, this particular algorithm fails. Right? So this raises the question whether the sampling is hard in this case. Of course, uh, it is very hard to show that something is hard, but what we were able to show was no non-algorithm can do it efficiently. So the best non-classical algorithm fails in this way. So I have a question about notation. In the first slide, a row goes in the middle way. So the dimension of lambda is Uh, but uh, 
uh, we do not have a complete, you know, uh, accurate proof for that. But you know, by basic intuition, uh, what we have is this n can be uh, changed to log n. So that, that's the best that we can use to by using that structure. I just want to point out that here is Sounds like I'm going to turn it on because I'm about to throw it up on So, okay, I'm a little bit confused with the image. Sorry to come back to this. So, I mean, how many? You start with Scalini's lattice, right? And you have any modes, and then you put one particle per mode. Is no, so we have, uh, what we are looking at is when we have the number of lattices fairly larger okay. than the number of lattices. I see. Oh, uh, sorry, number of particles. So we always choose capital N to be the number of particles, and um, in the thesis I use M as a number of that is I don't number of things. So can you back to that double band? So these things out of the edges are out of the edges. Yes. Yes. They come to the periodic boundary condition. I would just say in an open boundary condition, we do not have that. In an open boundary condition. Yeah. Would the open boundary conditions where you don't have those extra bands of the side would that affect the complexity? Um, so actually, this uh, so I have uh, shown you here two separate algorithms. So the C pin is one that mostly talks about W banded, and the Schwartz talks about single banded. So I can apply the single banded one. Okay. All right. So now uh, I talked about the very simple case of having the nearest neighbor in a 1D lattice, right? But that was not the original motivation that we want to be able to implement boson sampling using atoms in optical lattice. So uh, we should be able to generate arbitrary neutral transformation, like arbitrary lambda matrices. And it's not restricted to that kind of substance. We should be able to get any unitary matrices that we want. So of course we can do that by having an arbitrary long range coupling JLL prime. So if we can get access to any JLL prime or the coupling amplitude, then exponentiating that would give you access to any unitary transformation there. But having arbitrary long range coupling or coupling terms is, um, is extremely challenging. Right? So what we want to do is to restrict ourselves to quantity lattice and still be able to generate any unitary transformation. And the way we do it is to introduce time dependence to the problem. So basically what we consider is the Hamiltonian of this form, where HI are the list of Hamiltonians that we have access to, which are restricted to nearest neighbor. But we have these time dependent coefficients, which we call controlled waveforms. And we ask the question whether this time dependent Hamiltonian now can it generate any arbitrary dramatic or not. The quantum control theory gives you the answer, which says that if the set HI can generate all the discord minus one elements of the Lie algebra SUV, but now D is a dimension of the input space, and this setting is uh, generally without having any connection to the previous notations. So if the set HI, if we are able to show that using linear combinations and commutation relations, if we can generate all discord minus one Lie algebra elements, then quantum control theory tells you that using this time dependent Hamiltonian, we can generate any unit transformation that you want. Okay. So what we uh, also did in, in this paper was to propose these two uh, scalable realization in optical lattice. I, I wouldn't say propose the experiment because these are all experiments that already exist. Uh, so those were the spinal lattice and the quantum gas microscope. I'll explain what they are in the next slides. So the main result that we showed here was to show analytically uh, that these two systems are controllable, meaning that we were able to show by using linear combination and computation relation that we can generate all these terminus one elements of the algebra. And therefore, just by having this near neighbor connection and time dependence, we can generate arbitrary incrementals. And uh, we also have several sort of numerical results to support this analysis. So, um, yeah. I should just mention, I'm not trying to boost myself, but this was a really hard problem. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, so the first 
uh, it was the uh, spinal lattice. So uh, this optical lattice, the way we trap the atom is by having two counter-propagating lasers. So when we have two uh, waves, uh, you know, they come at each other and it forms a standing wave. And that is how these lattice sites or lattices are formed. And we trap the atoms in the, these energy states. Now, if we change the polarization angle of one of them, what we get instead of a simple sine or uh, cosine form is both sine and cosine with right circular and left circular form. So you get you effectively get two lines. <coughs> and now if you choose two energy states of the atom, internal energy states, call them spin down and spin up, such that they interact with this right circular and left circular light differently, then we'll be able to trap them uh, separately in this lattice. So spin down would be trapped in this lattice and spin up would be trapped in this lattice. So basically what we have is an N or M lattice size system tensor with a two dimensional uh, internal energy system. So in this system, uh, the Hamiltonian that we have control over is an overall quadratic potential that we can get by the ocean beam of the light. Then we have two microwave pulses uh, which drives the spin up to the spin down. And the phi here is the phase of the microwave and theta here is the polarization angle which uh, tells you what the distance between these sides is, how far these sides are uh, separated. So these phi and theta uh, are time dependent control parameters that one can access. So what we showed analytically was by changing this phi and theta and by using linear combination and combination relation, we can generate or discount and elements. Now the next uh, uh, platform that we took was the quantum gas microscope. This figure here is from the Adam Kaufman group at Jeda Border. So they had this control system. For the use uh, optical pieces to change the lattice depth and barrier height between its so in this Hamiltonian, they were able to control the barrier height between the nearest neighbor and the lattice depth. So in this case again, we show analytically that it is the system is controllable by having these two time dependent parameters. So, uh, so let me talk about what are the results. As I mentioned earlier, what we show is that these two systems are controllable, meaning that Given the Schrodinger evolution, so this is the Schrodinger evolution uh, given a time dependent Hamiltonian, there exists a final time of evolution t such that given any target unitary p target, we can find the control waveform, the so CI of t that is good, such that after the time of evolution t, we get the target unitary. So for the numerics, what we do is so we have a target unitary. Now we need to find what this control waveform is. So uh, the cost function for the optimization algorithm that we use is the fidelity for both unitary math and uh, state to state math like this. And then we give this cost function to the optimization algorithm. So we have an initial plus control waveforms, time dependent waveforms, and then uh, if you try to minimize or maximize the minimum for video or minus f or f, uh, maximize this one and then give back to you the control waveform that gets you close to the output. And in the numerical results, we were able to get infidelity, that is 1 minus f, as low as 10 to the mark minus 6. And theoretically or numerically, it is just limited by the numerical errors that we have. And we use the algorithm called GRADE, GRADE has a cost engineering algorithm. This is just a GRADE in the sense that we are going to climb the mountain to find the maximum. So, this is some of the numerical results that we have. Over the left side, we have the results for spin lattice, the first system that I showed. And here we have the quantum gas microscope. And on the y-axis, we have the natural logarithm of 1 minus f. So the lower is the better. And on the x-axis, for the spin lattice, uh, n here is the number of lattice sites. And remember that the total dimension is twice that amount, f, because of the fact that we have two energies. So whatever you see here, twice is the actual dimension of the system. And for quantum gas microscope, n is the number of lattice sites. So as you can see, we get, so these numbers actually mean 10 to the power of minus 6. So uh, this is, I 
very low. So this is log base E, is that what this means? Yes. Yeah, okay. Like, why is this 12? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, it's very natural logarithm. Yeah, actually when I was trying to get uh, figures for this talk, I had one in natural and one is 10. Uh, I would guess that when you increase the system dimension, you should get lower and lower fidelities because of the time taken. So I would say this is a more normal behavior for it to happen. But I don't I don't have an answer why this is working. But uh, I would I would guess that you would get lower and lower fidelities or higher and higher fidelity because uh, because the system size is so large and it's very difficult to find that optimal solution. So the final fidelity that you can get would be reduced for larger things. So yeah, getting into a little more details about the numerics, 
uh, I just want to mention that we use uh, piecewise constant control waveform, and the number of time steps that I use is, you know, uh, n squared or, or d squared for the d is a dimension. So that is, you know, nicely the number of free parameters that you need to do. Uh, so uh, I did some analysis on how much time it takes numerically. Uh, it was around between the cube and the four. It, it was like a cubic function in the system dimension. So, yeah, I, I, I don't have an answer to what. what I, I, I would suppose uh, quadratic scaling is inevitable, right? Because here, uh, yeah, how much you can better that from the cubic. Um. So, you, you mentioned about. Uh, Boasting way about you know how atoms can be so much better than photons because, for example, it's hard to get this, uh, indistinguishable um, photons. But what about the atoms? Are the atoms indistinguishable? And, and what's the, what's the um, uh, condition? Or what, what's the demand on the experimentalists to make these atoms? So, in that apparatus. So, as far as I understand, to make them indistinguishable, you have to put everything to the ground state. Right? You, you'll be basically using the same species, so that mm -hmm. is okay. But then you have this several energy states in the static side, so you have to hold all of them to the ground state and work with that. So, the excitations of that heating up and you know, how fast you do the controls, uh, all those things can actually excite them to. And also the lattice can be an over so maybe right. the wave functions are slightly different than different so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. yes. Uh, right. So yeah, so now I'll uh, move on to my second part of the talk. So this part is a I, I think of it as a natural extension to what I've been discussing. So basically in the atoms in optical lattices, uh, we were considering non interacting atoms. But of course we have these collisions between atoms which we usually represent as on-site interacting term. So what are the uh, effect of those interacting terms on the computer sample? And this was done in collaboration with uh, Shine Ingray and uh, Edwin Chapman. And because of coronavirus, I have AJ here from all the way from Sydney. Uh, yeah, he was supposed to attend the past meeting. <laughs> all right. Um, so, so, so what is the Hamiltonian that I am considering? So when we have this on-site interaction, uh, so the first part is the linear term that we have in the non-interacting case, where the atoms just tunnel from one side to other. And what we have here is the effect of interaction. So if you look at it, we have this sort of n squared minus n, or n any day minus one term, which is uh, basically a collision term, a pair of atoms. So given n atoms, the number of pairs is n divided minus 1. You can kind of naively think how it came about. So the part which I denote by h naught, you can see that it's linear, even n is also linear. And v here is a nonlinear you know, n squared, linear in n or a dagger a. So this x0 part uh, you know, will lead to a permanent, and because of the nonlinear term, it will be different. So the probability distribution here is uh, given by this, the unit rate evolution, and you start from, from number complication and you are measuring some other number complication. So uh, let me just discuss what are some of the motivations. So it is like a practical endless yes. where the atoms are. Yes. Uh, there's no restriction here on the JL. No. Right. no. I'm considering to do anything. No, I'm considering it in the system. So, so Whenever we have, you know, whenever we are trying to implement non-interacting boson, boson sampling, like the one we discussed in our first part, uh, we can uh, try out several techniques to reduce the interactions. Right? But, you know, even after doing that, there will be some residual interaction in the experiment when you try to do the non-interacting. So that is one of the motivations why we would like to uh, see this. 
we especially want to study the complexity of sampling in weak interaction limit. So we already know what's the complexity in non-interacting limit. What happens if you have a little bit of interaction? Uh, how does it change the complexity of sampling? So, so basically that means the strength u is, is very weak. And so since here we have nonlinear transformation instead of linear transformation, the probability amplitude cannot be written as a single permanent like we discussed in the boson sampling case. So the complexity here is unclear and that's what we are going to discuss in this part. Alright. So um, as I mentioned, the main culprit here is a nonlinear term up there, the x squared. So we need some way of transforming that nonlinear term into some effective linear terms like n. And one way of doing that is the Hubbard, Hubbard Saturnus transformation, uh, which is basically this integral. So we have a nonlinear exponential here, which of v curve by 2a. It can be written as a Gaussian integral of the linear term, exponential of dx. Right. So let's see how we can use this in our case. So we use this to turn this nonlinear term, so we have it in the exponential of the uh, Hamiltonian, the n squared root. Doesn't that have to be in the integral of minus v squared? Does that matter? Um, that's true. I mean, that's just a Gaussian integral, but a has to be, the real part of a has to be. Right, it has to be positive. positive but that's true for. But b be imaginary. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> b can be actually. This is true. It's always true. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's how we. Yeah, somehow it just. Right. So yeah, that's I think going to be important here because if we can square the answer of the imaginary, that is that we can square the answer of the Gaussian. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, it's true also even when that's not true. Okay. So maybe we can turn this uh, nonlinear exponential to a linear exponential in the same way, like having a Gaussian integral, and now B is complex. So you cannot have a real and one more thing to note here, the reason why we were able to do this for an operator and not a C number was because we are considering this in the numbers side basis. So we are measuring this in the number computation basis and in that basis this is a diagonal term and you can consider this as a C number. <coughs> so uh, this is what we will use but before getting um, into saying what the result is, let me explain this using a figure. So over here, we have the whole <coughs> boson hubbard evolution, which has both linear and nonlinear, x0 and v in it. And we can use the Trotter expansion, which basically tells you that we can approximate this or expand this as an alternate action of this linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear, etc. Uh, notice that here we have delta t instead of t. So now in this Trotter expansion, every word where we encounter a nonlinear exponential, we apply this Hubbard Saturn transformation and we can write that as an effective linear term or a Gaussian average of linear term. And in the end, what we get is a Gaussian average of linear transformation. So how do we use that here? So just to recap what we did, use the total expansion to write the post Hubbard Hamilton uh, evolution like this. And then every word we encounter this nonlinear transformation, we use the Hubbard Saturn transformation. And then finally, this linear transformation, as I mentioned earlier, is connected to a permanent or some matrix. So in effect, we can write the property amplitude as a Gaussian average of permanent of matrices. So the lambda here is actually non-unitary matrix now because of the fact that the B is plus complex. The B is no longer your imaginary, if it was imaginary, we would get uh, a Schrodinger evolution or sometimes called real time evolution, and we get unitary matrices here, but now we have non unitary matrices. So, uh, P is a Yes, P is a Gaussian. So, again, there are several other choices that you can do, you know, making A complex, and you know, the real part of A has to be greater than zero, and there are several other choices that you can make, but this is what. So this, in in my opinion, is a, you know very nice way of looking at <coughs> this problem. So even though the original 
boson sampling or a boson Hubbard evolution, we couldn't study the complexity of sampling because it was not connected to anything that we already know. So uh, this, in my opinion, is a, is a nice way of looking at it, but you know, there's still a lot of progress to be made in this direction to see, to study what's the complexity of sampling from an ensemble of permanents of some sort, right? So it's, uh, it, it's a different way of looking at it. Um, but what the PER stands for the permanent performance factor or something? Uh, yes. It's, it's the mass. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But it should have this factor. And, you know, I, I sort of wanted you to tell me a story about those nonlinear terms. It looks to me like what they do is they interfere with the, with the amplitude scattering. They try to, uh, they try to go through each other using the standard tunneling, but they see each other while they're in there, and that sort of screws up the, right. the tunneling. Is that the way to think of it? And how is, and that's, and so this whole thing shows that whole effect is this Gaussian. Yeah. So, uh, so that was uh, kind of thing that we uh, started looking at before in conferencing this, uh, you know, and thinking about how we can use this. So the way we used to think about was that you, you know, kind of like a payment path in your uh, like you start with some initial state, you have these so many paths where atoms can interfere with each other. And at all those points you have this uh, effect of interaction that it's in. It basically adds a phase uh, to the amplitude. So basically instead of them adding up to the permanent of unitary matrices, we have phases in each of these terms. So uh, if those phases were one, and those phases are random, or something, and the Gaussian reflects how you add each other. Right. Yeah. 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 And so I, I would guess that each of those feminine paths would have some property associated with it, and, and the average term. So each of them, I can write it as a phase times a permanent, but then when you add them, it just does that. Uh, but, yeah. All right. So. So now, uh, what we do, or what we use this for, is to see what's the complexity of sampling in the weak interaction limit. So when the interaction strength is very weak. So in this limit, uh, what we use is a distance measure, or the total variation distance, between any two probability distribution. So this, it is defined in this way. It's a one norm of t minus q. And uh, it is known that if this total variation distance a constant with respect to the input size, then complexity of sampling from either of these situations, P or Q, is the same. So basically what it tells you is that if you know the complexity of sampling from some probability distribution P, and if you know that there is another probability distribution Q which is very close in this distance measure, then the complexity of sampling from either of these distributions is the same. Right? So what we did in this uh, part of the project was to bound the total variation distance between the interacting phase, which we showed how we can write it as an average of permanent, and the non-interacting phase, which is the closest to that other, the non-interacting phase. So I didn't understand. Constant in what? Constant in the uh, input size, or in this case, it would be the dimension. Oh. Okay. So it's absolute. Yeah, it has to be. Well, you've got to that epsilon in a different way by assuming that the two distributions are the same uh, uh, so, or something. That is, P at every point is epsilon. That is, the difference at every point is less than epsilon times P. So, uh, yeah, I can. Is that assumption essential or is it just the final answer? Yes, so that's the uh, thing. So, multiplicity approximation of each property itself is a stronger assumption. Yes. That is not necessary for the complexity to be the same. This is a slightly weaker assumption than the multiplicity approximation. So if you start from the multiplicity approximation for each property, you can get to this. So you just yes. add them and you can get this. So this is a weaker assumption and you know, Scott Anderson mentioned this in the paper that getting multiplicity approximation for different probabilities is very hard. It's a stronger thing. But this this probably is an easier way to show that. It might be an easier thing to show 
for power distribution that you have. And, and, and he basically showed that this is enough uh, for the approximation of some channel. And who proved that? Where are you taking that result from? Uh, from the Scott uh, Anderson paper. The Scott Anderson's original Anderson Nard proposed uh, paper, uh, which introduced the cost of something. Um, all right, so, so this is the interacting, and this is the non interacting. And we were able to bound this uh, with this function. So this is what I have in the thesis, but uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, with the advice of Elizabeth Rosen and we um, and in Chinese and us, uh, all of us, so we were able to uh, tighten this bound to x squared by using results from these two. And I'll be happy to go into detail of this. Uh, I have some backup slides here. So if you want to know the details, I'll be happy to discuss that later. But you know, basically, we use other kinds of norms, like matrix norms and things like that. And the results that are already, you know, these uh, really people showed, we were able to connect them and tighten this bound to x squared, which is uh, which is more intuitive, I guess, because of uh, the fact that the interaction is bounded by x squared and not x squared. Uh, it's a two-body interaction, and, and somehow n squared term is what would come out as ten. And we were so frustrated that uh, the bound that you can get was only into the four um, or the inequality. Yeah, and minus n is the number of inputs that are five. Yes, the particles. Um, so if you put these bounds in the time. Yeah, uh, I think so. Because if you are not, uh, I mean, yet able to find the case for it saturates this bound, but I, I guess this is bound. But of course, yeah, one, uh, thanks for the question. Of course, this is for a general J enterprise. So this is for any uh, given graph structure, right? So for example, uh, I'll show you some numerical results later on. Like for some nearest neighbor or some other cases, you know, it can be tighter. If, if we so, maybe not. I mean, from what we we think so, and, and we are working on uh, and we show that uh, it's tighter for some other. So maybe the case that if we have more information about the graph structure and feeling like that, we may be able to write this for them. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not claiming it yet. We are still working on it, but that's a problem. And uh, yes. uh, right. So so now uh, the thing is, so what, what this uh, theorem says is that we have to keep this a small constant. So what the experimentalists would like to do is to limit the interaction such that ut only scales at 1 over n squared. Okay. Uh, rather than system size, they have to limit the interaction. So if this scaling is correct, then what they are doing is basically a non interacting version. Uh, so even though they have very weak interaction, they are basically sampling the sampling point that they are forming the same complexity as a non interacting version. And behind me, when I do bosons, Factor of 
the different uh, states that it can have. So we were limited by the company systems that we have. And the second case is for the nearest neighbor. So you, you only allow yourself to have nearest neighbor and uniform hopping. So this is the this is the same case that we discussed in our first part. So in this case, I'm not showing you the uh, total variation distance versus UT. I want to focus on a different observation that we made. So this plot is supposed to show you the dependence on the choice of initial state. So what is the effect of the total variation distance with the choice of initial state? So these different uh, points that you see in the graph are for different initial states. And for the case of nearest neighbor and uniform hopping, we know if you take the periodic boundary condition, all you have is a ring where the atoms hop from one point to another, something like this. So because this total variation distance is basically the effect of the interaction between this particle, a notion of density comes in. So how, how dense is the initial state? And that will affect the total variation distance. So in this case, uh, I chose what is called the circular variance as the as a way to quantify the, that density. So basically, what it says is that if we have four particles that are spread like this, it tells you something about how spread the particles are in that ring. So basically, the sum here is so this exponentially to the minus i two by l or n. You can consider it as a vector uh, that goes from the origin to the particle. And for example, if we have equally spread particles. And if you add all this vector, you get 0. So this part is 0. And then the circular variance is 1 minus 0. So this is 1. So the maximum values that you see here are for the initial states which are spread out. So here the y-axis is uh, total variance distance. And the x-axis is the circular variance. And the other extreme is when all the particles are in one value side. So in that case, all the vectors would add up. And then you would get this average as 1 and the circular variance would be 0 and that's what you see in here. So what this plot tells you is that there is kind of a monotonic behavior of the total variance distance with the circular variance. Almost monotonic. Uh, so uh, the purpose of this study was mainly to see what the dependence is on the initial state and kind of a future direction at least in, for my own uh, curiosity is how can we come up with some quantifying things like this for a general graph structure, which is a very hard problem, but we can say something about the notion of density for a general graph. Um, so yeah, that's something that I'm interested in as a general graph. Alright, so um, what is the intuition? Uh, behind this resource. This result? Yeah. So, uh, so basically, uh, the reason for this total variation distance is the effect of interaction. And uh, I would say that the effect of interaction is more when there's a more probability of the atoms to see each other. So when you have any initial state that is already packed, uh, instantaneously this atom starts seeing each other and we have a big effect on the total variation. But if it is spread out, it takes some time for them to see each other. And so it looks like they remain spread. Yes. So uh, this so this is kind of a uh, work in progress, and uh, so this is regarding the arbitrary interaction strength. So we were considering the weak interaction limit, and we would like to ask the question: What is the sampling complexity for arbitrary interaction strength? So uh, the proof that we show here uses two different techniques, and I would like to explain them one by one in two slides. So first technique that we use is something called the worst case to average case reduction technique. So this was it's a standard technique and was also recently used in this paper. Uh, okay, so what is this technique? So suppose we have a set of problems u1 by k. Then you can think of it as uh, the problem to be calculated the moment of matrices as simple as that. So we have several matrices and calculate the moment of them is a problem. So set A, suppose it contains all the matrices that you have. And suppose there is an instance, small a, within that, which we already know the complexity of, which 
we already know is one. So we have these several matrices, and there is one matrix that we already know captures the problem is one. Okay. So now suppose the following is true. Suppose you give me many instances of this problem, the solution to that. So there are several matrices other than the hard case. You find out what the permanent is and give me the answer. So I have this set of permanents of these kind of matrices with me. Suppose using that information, you are able to solve the hard instance. Okay. So we know that there is one worst case or the hardest case. And using the information of solving some other many problems, we were able to solve this one particular problem. Then we can say that on average, any problem in A is at least as hard as this first case in And then there is this technical point that this many instances have to be a polynomial in the input size. Input size meaning the dimensional matrix in this case. Okay. So this is called the worst case to average case reduction technique. So we are actually reducing the worst case to an average case. So solving average case would let you solve the worst case. Right. So this is one technique. The next technique is something called the polynomial interpolation. So this is basically saying that given many data points and if you already know they follow a polynomial function, then you can use curve fitting and figure out what the polynomial is. And then interpolate it to an unknown data point. So comparing these two techniques, we can think of these as the average cases, the solution to the average cases and the unknown case as a worst case. So given the data points of the average case, we are able to polynomially interpolate to the worst case. Right? So how do we use these two techniques uh, to say something about the complex field sampling in this case? So again, the post Hubbard model is given by this. H0 is the linear part, V is the non-linear part. So U equal to 0, when we have the non-interacting case, that is something that we already discussed in the, in the first part. We know that we can implement the whole Boson sampling system that. So u equal to 0 is something that we already know. That we can take as a worst case. And now a random u for each u will be a different problem. Right? And so each u we can take it as an average case. So what we were able to show was that the probability amplitude that we are asking the question what is the complexity of capital in that under some assumption like a total approximation is a polynomial in u. So if it's a polynomial in U, given many data points in U, I can find or use polynomial interpolation to find out what the problem is at U equal to 0. Right? So that tells you that the sampling at a random U is at least as hard as a non-interacting case. Now just to be more specific, especially to the committee, what the total approximation says is that this P is a polynomial in the number of uh, particles or n. So you have this polynomial in many terms in the total approximation. I basically introduce you know identity in each point and <coughs> using a payment path in regular type of thing. And then finally you get a Taylor series and then I show that by truncating the Taylor series at some polynomial some high degree, I can uh, those two are multiplicative cross or exponential cross. So this is very close to a polynomial in there. Now uh, I say this is a work in progress because this has a lot of caveats in it. For example, what happens if the polynomial interpolation fails? So there are a lot of works in, especially in other areas of physics and maths, where they have observed that this polynomial interpolation may not work always. So one example that we could think of may be during the phase transition happening. So you know that uh, depending on the value of u, there is a phase transition happening in this post hubbard model. So maybe it is true that uh, the polynomial interpolation fails and you know, we may not be able to <coughs> interpolate it from let's say the mod insulator phase to the superfluid phase in the case of this. So that is one open problem in this and also whether this daughter approximation is valid at all, right? Or at all. Yeah. Because we need to have this approximation for polynomial in many whether they will have some opportunity approximation to the original amplitude. Right. Uh, 
So the summary of this talk. First, I talked about the sample complexity of non-interacting boson particles. Then we looked at the very simple case of uniform near center hopping. Then we showed that it was easy after the government in the number of particles time of prediction. And we conjectured that it is hard for faster scaling. We also showed you uh, two scalable realizations where we sh showed analytically that the system is controllable. And we also showed the numerical results to support that. Then we worked on the natural extension uh, where we asked the question what's the complexity of sampling of interacting bosons. So an important result there was that we can see this amplitude at an average, a motion average of permanent of non unity matrices. This is, in my opinion, a, a new way of thinking about what the complexity is. And we also showed that weak interaction is, has the same complexity as the, interact, as, as the non interacting case. And for arbitrary interaction, it's a work in progress, but preliminary research seems to say that it is at least as hard as non interacting case. Now, there was this third project which I talked about, which was regarding the efficient generation of power and linear transformation, where we actually use uh, random Hamiltonian evolution, like the ones we discussed here. We had these controlled waveforms. So, what happens if we use random controlled waveforms? So, put in random controlled waveforms and see what kind of unity. So we use several numerical tools to see how close that is to a uh, random unity matrix. And uh, this work, the third work was uh, done in collaboration with Chris Jackson. Uh, uh, and some of the future directions that uh, I think is very important. One, uh, for the average interaction proof, what does the polynomial interpolation face? And also regarding the total approximation. And now one, uh, one thought is that it could fail near the ground state phase transition and that could open up uh, a way to answer the questions how is sampling complexity related to other properties in many body physics like phase transition or confirmation and so And in the other project, uh, we need to do more analytical studies to see we were not able to uh, fully do analytics on this hard problem but I would like to continue working on this and to see more analytical studies to see how close these pseudo random matrices are. So that was my summary of the talk and I would like to end with some acknowledgement. First of all, I would like to thank my advisor, Evan Rush, who has been nothing but a tremendous support throughout my PhD life. Uh, and yeah, I, 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 have, I mean, rarely I have seen him being angry on me having all the self or something like that. And one time I remember, uh, uh, he was, I don't know, he said that he was angry at uh, our group, which I never thought he was. And then he came to me and ap apologized to me later on for being like, I don't know which professor would do that to the students, but I'm, I'm really happy and honored to be his student. And you know, there have been lots of ups and downs as on BST life should be and he has been there with me the whole time. And I would also like to thank my collaborators, uh, Akimasa Miyake, who has been uh, very helpful in several projects that I did. And then Shaoni and Adrian in the projects that I discussed here. And of course Chris, I, the main reason why I couldn't talk about it today was that in my opinion it was the hardest problem that I ever tried to tackle. And we had so much fun doing that and I had, I had learned a lot of things from the press and, and thanks for those uh, fun times. And I, I would like to thank other committee members, Carl, Akimasa and Rolando who came from Los Alamos to be here. And I should say who also graciously offered me a job at Vandal uh, <laughs> to go and work on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wanted it too, but <laughs> 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 I mean, there's been many applications, and you were selected to work on it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. And of course, I should uh, thank my funding agency who helped me eat outside and uh, <laughs> be hungry, sleep uh, late, especially uh, you and I, uh, NSF and Google. And I would like to thank all of you for being here, and especially. Most of my friends in the back have been very supportive throughout my uh, 
life here in New Mexico. I guess I will continue my life in New Mexico for a few more years. <laughs> but, and uh, lastly, uh, to my parents and my family, and my wife who is there in Skype, who is in India, I think it is 5 a.m. in India, and she has been <laughs> awake the whole time. <laughs> and, and also to my unborn child, carrying my, my child, and she is new very soon. And I thank you all again, and yeah, I, I'll take any questions.
So let's pretend that I am an experiment tool for now, and that I have quantum gas microscope, okay. and I believe your controllability proofs, which are for non blasting case. Okay. Uh, but in my experiment, I can't have, I don't have the uh, u equal to zero. Okay. Can I still use your result of controllability on my quantum gas microscope? And how we for the yes, if not, how well can I do with the quantum gas microscope where I have a little bit of interaction left? So you, you're asking the question whether my results apply if you think about uh, time dependent Hamiltonian and yes. a control this concept. Uh, I would say yes, but I'm not sure because it, it just comes from the intuition that very little bit of Weak interaction shouldn't make things so much hard. So that was the same intuition that led us, you know, showing that. But it's my intuition, but we will have to work on that too. So I think that. Can you say anything about the connection between this trace distance we saw plus the absolute? have the ability to distribute the distribution that might lessen the complexity So so you're basically asking the question of how does the uh, how similar the complexity are versus how distribution that the complexity should vary if we can distinguish them, uh, but I don't know. Uh, I, I would say that complexity also, or I should say the complexity might not grow or, or change, but we cannot compare them. So basically, the P and Q, which is distinguishable and far off, may also have the same complexity, uh, but we just can't compare them. So, so I, uh, and I always thought that this distinction between two broad institutions have everything to do with the fact that they have common space the same thing. Uh, talking about the scaling Thank you.